I'll start. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Thomas Munro. I work for Enterprise DB. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the continuous integration project that I've been doing to test patches in Postgres. Um, yeah, hi. Okay, so I'm going to get started. So um, I work for Enterprise DB. I've been there for three years now. Um, and um, I, I guess the biggest thing I've done so far is parallel hash joins, which are coming into Postgres 11 and some other stuff. Um, so I made this thing. Uh, that's a website. And it, it shows you a list of all the patches that are currently proposed for Postgres and answers three very simple questions. Does the patch apply? Do the tests pass on Linux? And do the tests pass on Windows? Um, it's just these little things here, right? <coughs> and there's a view of, um, uh, there's, it also can be filtered by, filtered by author. So if you're a patch author, I've put Michael Paquier here because he's like the patch author superstar. He has more patches than anyone else by far. Um, and if you click on those little things there, if it's a fail, you click on it, you can go and read the build log. Or if it's, it's you can always read the build log, not just for fails. And there's, a, there's one for Windows and one for Linux. And um, <coughs> I find that pretty useful because I, I don't really like, I don't have Windows, I don't work on Windows, so like, you know, in this case you can see somebody also, someone here also doesn't test on Windows and, and something broke and that's quite <laughs> useful to know, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> so the other thing is that um, core file backtraces are shown if something crashes and regression test output is shown. Okay, so that's like what it is. I thought I'd just come straight out and show that. <laughs> show that. I mean, you know, it, it's very simple. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the motivation behind that and what I'm trying to achieve and where I'm trying to go with this thing. Okay, so basically the, the PGSQL hackers mailing list has around about 140 people contributing code. Um, the, the, there's slightly more people contributing code than people contributing to commit fests because not everything gets registered, but you know, it's that kind of order of, of uh, number. Um, we have about 500 people contributing to discussions, and there's around about currently around about 250 patches in consideration being proposed at any given time, which is a lot of code, right? Um, now we have the Commit Fest uh, website uh, where these patches are proposed. Oh, five times, five times. Yeah. <laughs> Four times, right? Five times. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> All the actual work of proposing patches and discussing them and getting them committed all happens through the mailing lists, but we have this website where we just register, register the, the patch, you want someone to review it, you know. So the website is an important part of the process, but we're not actually really using the website for the, for the review work as some other projects do. And um, that's, the, that's the case for many larger projects, famously Linux, but also some others. Um, using a, mail, a mailing list centric system seems to work quite well for things that involve a lot of discussion. Um, yeah. So putting things into the CommitFest website is our equivalent of making a pull request. Um, now, over the past few years, uh, yeah, th this is the complete history of the current, the current CommitFest application. Um, there was another CommitFest before that, I think, made by Robert. I, I didn't try and pull data from there because I don't know where it is. Um, but if you, if you go back to just four years ago, we were, we were doing, we had around about 80 patches in each commit fest, and now we're up to about 250. I think that's, that's pretty impressive, and that's actually happening because we have more contributors. Yeah. Or depressive. Or depressive, <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> and if, if you look at those two charts, you can see that they're highly correlated. Basically, we have more people showing up, and more people write more code, which is cool. It feels better than just the concern raised previously that we just keep funding things forward. Right. So, <laughs> so, and, and that's actually a really interesting question. Do we just keep punting things forward? And if you look at this, I've shown in blue here when things are being moved forward, um, which raises the question, well, how far do they get punted? And so I tried to capture that with another chart here. I took the, all the patches that reached a final status in the last commit fest. Now, that was a final commit fest, so maybe the statistics would be different for a different one. I don't, didn't look into that, but um, you can actually see that um, around about half of our proposed uh, patches are committed within one commit fest, so basically slam dunks. Half as many again take two commit fests to get in, and then half as many again take four commit fests to get in. And then we have some outliers over here. And we have some stuff, of course, which has never actually reached a final state. It could be, it's been bouncing around for years. Um, so 
that's quite a lot of code that you have to keep working for a long period of time and keep up with changes. Um, and my kind of central idea here is that um, like wasting people's time is a really bad idea. Um, and it's not going to help us deal with all this code. So um, there's a whole series of different things that you can discover automatically. Um, the most trivial one, usually it's trivial, is just bit rot, right? Because like the master branch keeps changing, like seven or eight or whatever commits per day, and you know your code's going to have a typical patches seem to last for a few weeks, and then they get bit rot, right? But sometimes the bit rot's more serious. It actually is, it's telling you that, that the code is changing in an incompatible way, and you better keep up with that. And it, it's actually an important change rather than just you know white space or some other crap like that. Um, the other thing is that other compilers can be more picky than yours or, or using more warnings enabled or something like that. Tests fail uh, because people don't always test their stuff. Um, they might test make check, but they might not run the full uh, make check world, or they may not have all the you know, obscure build options or tap tests enabled or whatever. Um, that happens all the time, actually. A pretty good percentage of patches uh, you know, fail in some obscure test that no one ever really runs uh, manually. Uh, then we have portability bugs, endianness, word size, OS libraries, all that kind of stuff. Um, so Windows is uh, a great example. Loads of patches just don't build on Windows the first time anyone posts the patch, and you know, eventually we get that fixed. Um, there's also things that are non-deterministic, like just running stuff on a different computer can find race conditions or um, you know, uninitialized data, which worked out okay on your computer but doesn't work on some other computers. So just running things on more computers is a good idea, right? Um, and very frequently, patches have broken documentation because people just jump in there and edit the text and then send the patch and they never actually build it because it's kind of painful to install the tools and everything. Um, so we do have a build farm, which is um, an incredibly valuable thing that tests everything in the master branch on a ton of different computers. Um, <laughs> but that happens after commit. So, you know, if, if you break the build farm, um, they sit here, ask me how I know, you know, pe pe people, uh, you know, you're wasting a lot of people's time. And, and not only are you requiring people to do things to, to fix it, um, you're also, it's a single shared resource, the build farm, right? If you turn it red, then no one else is getting that stuff tested until, until you turn it green again, right? So that's kind of like, we need to have that, but I'd like to push some of the automation earlier in the pipeline and do it, in, do it at, at a point before you've actually reached the shared resource, right? Um, so um, how does this thing work? Well, exactly a year ago at this very conference, someone was complaining to me about my patch not applying. And uh, I was, it's something that I'd been, you know, it's quite a large, complicated thing, which is um, still not committed. And, and, and it's like, it's hard to get people to, to uh, you know, there's a kind of mental load involved with this particular patch. And um, I felt really bad that someone had taken an interest in the thing and gone and tried to apply it. And then like, you know, I'd kind of wasted their time, right? So my first step was I set up a, a cron job that just would email me in the morning when, um, just when my own patches don't apply. And then from there, I just incrementally built from there. And I started um, checking for bit, uh, bit rotten patches that I was interested in reviewing. And then I started running the tests. And then I started freaking out because like, now I'm running random code I downloaded from the internet. And like, it's, you know. So then, <laughs> so then I stopped doing that. <laughs> and I thought, well, what's the right way to do this? Um, so before. <laughs> Before you even get to actually running the code, the first thing you have to do is apply the patch. And um, if you go and look at um, the, <coughs> if you if you go and look at the history of patch, I mean, recently there's been a few headlines because there's been some recent CVEs there. I mean, patch is just it's an amazing piece of software that's enabled us to do what we do. But like, man, that software is just full of holes. I mean, it it was designed in a time when it, it, it was not like, you know, it, it, there's ways to shell out and make it run shell scripts, and there's ways to like it wasn't really didn't really live in the directory it was supposed to be targeting. You know, you could get out of the, you know, there's all these different things that could, you, you could do with it. And they keep patching it and improving it. There's more than one strain of patch. I don't know if they're related or not, but there's, um, there's, the, there's the BSD one and there's the GNU one, and I don't know, there's the, there may be multiple patches that, that, that they have. Dip. Some of these CVs actually apply to, to, to all of them, which I think means they must have a common ancestor, but they seem to be a bit different by now. Whatever, you can't trust it. So. <laughs> <laughs> So what I came up with was um, I run this thing in a, in a jail. I, I use FreeBSD for this. Um, I have a, can I use this thing? I have this uh, pristine source tree with like nothing from the internet on it. And then I, I clone that. 
and I just do all the work inside a clone. This whole process just takes like less than a second to um, start up a jail, which is like a container. I think FreeBSD jails might be better than containers on Linux in terms of security, but I'm not entirely sure. But it's like a Solaris zone or whatever. It's like it can't access the network. It can't like there's resource limits, and like then you just nuke it and it's gone, right? So that way I can finish up with a with a um, a way to take all these patches and push them out to GitHub. Um, once they get to GitHub, you see all these branches are created. That, that's the commit fest ID number. Um, and you can go and look at that on GitHub. I've got this user postgresql cf bot. Um, so that's the end of the involvement of like my server that's like chewing on these these patches. Once it gets to there, um, yeah, and you can see the if you if you look at the individual branches on GitHub, you can actually see the the patch that's been applied. It's got a machine-generated commit message that just tells you like who really wrote this and has a link to the mailing list and so on, so you can see where the actual patch came from and so on. Um, so the next step is to actually build and test the thing. I didn't really want to own that problem myself um, for the reasons described before. Like, I just don't really, it's code from the internet. I mean, I don't think anyone's really going to send malicious code to the Postgres mailing list, right? But still, as a matter of principle. Hmm? Now we know what you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So fortunately, there's this whole industry now of companies providing uh, continuous integration as a service, which basically means build bot boxes, right? And they're just like, uh, I think these things might, I think Travis ones are on EC2. I don't know. But basically, it's just like a really easy way where they'll monitor your GitHub repo or any other public Git repository. And if they see a certain control file in there, they'll just run the stuff that's in there. And you know that's really convenient for this. Um, Appveyor.com is, is a similar company that does it for Windows, which I think is incredibly valuable because I don't want to touch Windows, and like they'll do it for me. It's it's fantastic. Um, so, um, anyone here using these kind of tools themselves? Okay, so um, almost half the people in the room. That's pretty cool. Um, so, it, it's very easy to set up. You just stick one of these control files into your um, into the tree. I think in some cases you can also configure it to get, a, get configuration from outside the tree, but like the really lazy way is to just like, like I actually just have a patch sitting in my home directory and I just like apply that patch, push it to some branch name I just make up, um, and then push it onto GitHub and then these things will build it for me. That's what you need to do, right? It's very simple. Um, so using that yourself is quite easy. I use that myself when I want to test Windows stuff. Um, but what this talk is about is how to plug our mailing list into that. So yeah, that's involved a bit of extra machinery. So what I finished up building is this, um, I just like have like, I know, it's like five bucks a month kind of VPS, like tiny virtual uh, machine that simply uh, polls these things uh, not too frequently, I hope. I haven't had any complaints from the <laughs> PGN for guys yet. <laughs> and just simply pushes that stuff out to GitHub where it goes to Travis and, and AppLayer. Um, <coughs> If you go directly onto the Travis website, you can actually see where, those where it's detected those branches, and they'll build, I think, three or four at a time. Um, and you can see the build history for each individual branch. So yeah, that's all relatively simple. Um, and then I, I collect the results up. I'm only, I actually only just started doing that. Earlier, I had it so it was, I, my website was just showing the badges, which were just like a, an image sourced from their website. But then I didn't really have the data, and that led to some interesting problems, like I couldn't really um, uh, well, I'll talk about that on the, on the next slide, what I'm planning to do with that data. So um, it doesn't work perfectly. I've still got some active battles. Um, in fact, I was hoping by talking about this here to maybe uh, see if anyone knows how to fix some of these problems. Um, for Windows, which is like a major part of my goal here, was to test on an operating system that I don't have and that I think about maybe 1% of Postgres hackers actually work on. I don't know. Who works on Windows here? Anyone? Okay, so we've got... Who likes it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so to get Windows working, um, I actually um, I asked um, Andrew uh, Dunstan, who's over here, uh, to um, well, I just asked on the mailing list, and Andrew very generously uh, extracted some bits of the build, build farm Perl scripts um, that he maintains um, to get this thing going on out there. And I've I've sort of been tweaking and hacking on that ever since. Um, the thing that it can't run is the um, the table space test, and uh, this is what I'm hoping, by talking about this problem, I'm hoping if anyone might, you know, the table space, if, if you actually run as administrator, you get a permissions failure when you try and run the table space test. Did you know about this? Dave? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I think you mentioned it. Yeah. Okay. Because right. it's the test that we have the most trouble with in our uh -huh. test. So like as a Unix guy, when I see this thing where if you have the most privileges, then you get a, a uh, you get told you can't do it because you don't have enough privileges. So you drop to a lower privileged user and then it works. I, I don't know what's <laughs> going on with that. Like, very familiar. Those customers are too early to move. Yeah. <laughs> So um, I'm hoping that someone can help us figure that out. Um, it doesn't run Check World yet. It really should do that. Um, but this, uh, that's just because I haven't got around to stealing those bits of the build farm yet. And I'll, I'll get there. Um, OK. There's some other um, occasional transient failures, which are kind of annoying because they make the whole thing less reliable. Um, mainly, it's that um, SourceForge is really flaky. And um, I don't know what they did. I actually. I mean, it's kind of a venerable thing that's kind of, uh, anyway, I don't want to talk about SourceForge. But basically, they, um, they get DOSed all the time, because for some reason, people on the internet hate them and attack their servers. <laughs> so that's why sometimes, and that's actually, um, they, and they moved their data center recently. And that's the reason why everyone who runs like make docs on a computer that doesn't have the XSL stuff installed, it stopped working. Uh, Robert and I discussed this on the mailing list um, in the, uh, it was about two months ago or something. Um, because several bits of the build stuff actually go out to the internet. So if the internet's not working, or if, you know, SourceForge in particular, which hosts some of the XSL files that we need. Um, so that's a, a source of transient failures. Um, probably like one in a thousand builds, or maybe even less. But um, it's kind of annoying, because like, you see the red flag, you go and investigate, and you just wasted your time, right? Um, there's also one particular tap test that I haven't really figured out. Um, it occasionally fails the crash restart one. Sometimes it, there's like a 60 second timeout in there and it reaches the timeout, but I can't figure out why it's reached the timeout. It's like, is it because the virtual machine is just being extremely slow or is it because I'm looking at Antis because this, this is his uh, yeah. test. Um, but I think there may actually be a bug. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I it's found it. Honors is code? <laughs> 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 it's, yeah. I, that one is probably telling us there's a bug, but I, I don't know what it is. Um, there's some weird timeouts we see in the regular build farm occasionally, and never yeah. quite sure if the machine is just really slow or what. Uh -huh. so. Well, this, this would be so slow that I don't think I could explain it, because the timeout in question is 60 seconds. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like a, an immediate shutdown. Wait 60 seconds, and it hasn't shut down. Yeah. So maybe yeah, the post script's busted. Yeah. Hang on a second. It couldn't be that stuff with the signal handlers being busted and doing non reentrance stuff. No, because we do kill nine. Oh, okay. In the background. All right. Okay. So, yeah. So yeah, that's probably not a false negative, but I don't know. I can't prove that. <laughs> um, so yeah, what am I going to do to fix those uh, problems with the network? I, I probably need to figure out how to get more of the stuff to be local so that it doesn't have to go to the network. I haven't really got to the bottom of that yet. Um, I actually proposed that we might change our um, make docs so that it doesn't point to SourceForge anymore and instead points to um, I forgot on the URL they use now that the, the, the people that do doc books, they've actually moved off SourceForge, but our stuff still points to the old location. So yeah, that might be an improvement we could make. Um, some of the plans for the future. Well, the main thing that I want to get done, and I'm in uh, discussions with Magnus about this, is just move this stuff onto the actual commit fest and then shut down my website, because I don't really want to run a website. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, you know, that's really a terrible mock up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. See why I don't want to be in the website business. <laughs> um, and basically, the way this is going to work, um, if um, well, firstly, it needs to be reliable enough that the information is worth putting onto the main commit first application. Like, I don't want to, you know, this thing is supposed to save people time. If it wastes people's time, then it wouldn't be a success. I think it's getting pretty close to being reliable enough. Um, so, what we're discussing is a way to make it so that the, the commit first app would just have an, an endpoint, an HTTP endpoint, and we would just like my CF bot will just hammer it with results, and they'll show up here. Very simple. Um, I guess you probably want to filter by them. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Uh, I guess one thing that will be important if you're going to do that, 
is to not show results that are stale. Uh -huh. The last test was against uh -huh. the patch version has been obsoleted by a recent. Yes, that's a good point. Well, how often you, you, it's hard to do that in your existing app, but I would think on the main website we would be able to know yeah. which test version was tested last. Uh -huh. Yes. That's a good idea. Yeah, how do you, how do you update it from when you go into main? Right. So what I actually do, I've actually, up until like about two weeks ago, um, it was really quite stupid. I just used to like just build something every five minutes and just go around <laughs> in, a, in, in, in like commit fest ID order. But that was actually using too much of the generous resources of TravisCI.org, for example. Like I didn't want to like just waste their CPUs with that level of abandon. You know? So um, what I do now is I actually pull this page every minute. And if that latest mail date changes, then I go and read the thread. And um, if, if I see a new patch that I haven't seen before, I, I create a new branch. So usually that happens. And, and then I also rebuild every single uh, patch once every 48 hours. Okay, so That's the two different. Against tests is what it was like. Yeah. You yeah. write against tests. Okay. Yeah. So, so I actually I pull from master. Right. Like I update, you know, I, I, like a, I do a fresh. Right, 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 yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So yeah, you, your stuff gets tested every two days minimum. But when you send a new patch, I try and pick it up straight away. Because like the earlier version, people would email me and say, hey, your thing doesn't work. But actually, it would just take a really long time to get around to that ID because <laughs> it, it was too stupid. But this, what I was trying to do there is um, start pulling this thing. I have discovered that it's not that reliable sometimes. Sometimes uh, there's some inconsistency. That, that's a bit boring. I'm not going to go into that. But How do you I, So um, ideas for the future. Um, one thing that I looked into is running Go Coverity, which is a static analysis tool that can tell you really clever things about your code that, you, um, that it can be very valuable. And, we, and, and Coverity offers a free service to open source projects. And it does run on, I don't know who, I think, is it Michael who looks at it? Some, somebody occasionally reports to us on. The oh. security team. OK, the security. Okay, yeah, right. so the security team has access to the Coverity instance that's run. Okay. And we do that. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So it's not public, but no. but it's being looked at. So yeah, it's that's done. cool. We it. We yeah. It yeah. So anyway, Coverity will let any open source project uh, use their stuff for free. But I looked into doing this, and I figured out that for projects over a million lines of source code, they only let you run one, one test per day. So it would take about nine months to get through each commit fest. Yeah. Um, yeah that's why we do it once, once a week. Yeah. So if you wanted to use Coverity, you probably just have to buy it. I think. Um, if you wanted to test everybody's patches with Coverity, like earlier in the pipeline, as I'm doing here, so that's probably. Not. Through the fact that Coverity hits a lot of things in just Postgres that are false positives. Uh huh. Yeah, there is a lot, a lot of those. Uh huh. It's, I mean, it's an effort to keep it maintained. It really is. Right. So, so that's, that one's probably not worth pursuing. Uh, running <laughs> running all patches with uh, Valgrind, Valgrind, however you say it, that would probably be a good idea. Um, I don't have to. I don't have to. You know, I could just do that once a week, though, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be. But it's like two and a half hours per uh, patch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe it's okay to just leave that to be. It's all somebody else's machines. Yeah. Travis, time's up. Yeah. The isolation test takes about four hours. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot of machines. Sorry. That's a lot of machines. Oh, okay. Yeah. But certainly on one of my test machines, we're running it. It's it's a lot. That's amazing. So, okay, so that's another one which it seems like it's best to just leave it to be after the, the do it on the build farm where, where you know, there's apparently, was that two, three machines? Andrew runs at least one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and uh, Andrew as well. And ceiling static analyzer is. No good? There's just not much to it. Uh -huh. um, you know, they're, they're adding stuff, but right now it's just really, it, it, there's not much to it. Okay. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Um, anything that it reports should definitely be fixed. 
or, or, or excluded or looked at or something. It just doesn't have that many classes of, mm -hmm. of issues that it's looking at currently. I mean, over time, to make it a lot better. Mm -hmm. but, but we do run it anyway on backgrounds for every regression run, just to make cool. sure we're not losing, missing anything. Yeah. And it's quick, relatively. <coughs> So another idea is to add one more platform. Um, I don't want to have like a whole build farm worth of different operating systems because um, firstly, no one will give them to me for free. Um, that's the primary reason. Um, <laughs> also because it's just a pain to maintain all these things, right? So uh, I think one really well-judged system, I was thinking maybe a 32-bit non-Linux system with a big Indian <coughs> architecture might be useful because you'd sort of hit several things at once with one extra build. But I'd have to run that myself. I mean, I'd have to own the problem of running the untrusted code on the, because no, like th those companies, no one has weird systems like that. They only, they only have very mainstream systems. So I'm, I'm partway towards getting that working on Travis with an emulator. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like QEMU or something. This is a constant problem for me because we, you know, on this Debian we support 32-bit big Indian systems, big Indian systems in general, and I have nowhere to test it. Uh -huh. uh, so I just get bug reports or like you know it doesn't build or something or the tests don't run, and I'm like, uh. Let me make something up <laughs> and send it off. To so, and, 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 you know, I usually get it right. So, I'm like, so this is like QMU. And it's usually the tests that are failing, not the the code's fine. Uh -huh. But the tests are constructed in a way that will only pass on a little Indian system. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So I have to construct the tests in such a way that they calculate the value that they need by other means and right. compare it to the value that the application is the other yeah. backrest is generating. It's a big pain in the butt, so I've, I've been kind of working on that. I haven't Interesting. Oh, I'd love to yet, hear about how that. But I'd be happy to send it to you. If I actually That'd be great. Done. Yeah. So is that using QMU? Yeah. And like PPC or well, we, uh, which architecture? Is it PowerPC or we, how do you get the big oh, Indian? Oh, um, it was PowerPC, I believe. Yeah. Okay. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Yeah. Because um, I actually I managed to run Postgres once in in exactly that in QMU with PowerPC. It was so slow. It was like. Uh, I, got, I guess it would, it would probably take hours to run the. Yeah, in my case, I'm, again, like the algorithm, I'm just trying to get unit tests to run. Uh -huh. If I can get them to run on, on big Indian systems, then I feel pretty good about uh -huh. the yeah. um, well, I actually looked into um, PowerPC um, VPSs that you can rent on the internet. And w whereas you can get a, an Intel, like tiny, whatever, from like Digital <laughs> Ocean or like yeah. Amazon EC2 for like a few bucks a month. Power hardware starts at about a thousand bucks a month, yeah. so that's, that's, awesome. that's not going to happen. <laughs> but we have I mean, one of the one of the hosting organizations that we're working with has an ARM box, I don't know if that would be helpful or not. But we could possibly. I mean, the, the well, big question actually comes down to because we already have built farm members to cover this, right? Yeah, so maybe it's not so worth worrying about that. Yeah, the that's I mean. About running untrusted code because I don't think we want to run untrusted code. On no, you, I. I don't think you should do that. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there? I mean, we've had this discussion before, but is there some way to have somebody like do a review of the code who's been trusted, or, or at least yeah. is somebody who is trusted who submits the patch? Yeah, but then do you trust that the I don't know. the pipeline though? I mean, you know, even if you trust the person who whose name is on the patch, do you trust the whole pipeline? You know, I mean, well, what you could do is it's like a forged test. email, right? No, no, no. I mean, in the commit test app, you could have somebody who has a unity account who actually logs in. Okay yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, another idea is that if I'm doing all this, I could I could also actually display the build documentation so that people who are reviewing patches have just have the documentation built. They can go and look at it. Uh, I guess you'd want to somehow highlight the bits that changed. I don't really know how to do that, or at least like show you the take you directly to the pages that were that were affected by the. Just uh, verifying the compiles are not as there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and yeah. Yeah. Green this to make whatever check for the HTML stuff and take me takes like I don't know, half another half another second or something. Well it's quick but you need all this stuff in the store. Yeah, yeah, but like yeah. it's still like for the most part like I don't that thing not yeah. having to actually build it. Yeah. So another idea I had is um See, at the moment, I've got that thing that I showed earlier where I have like a FreeBSD jail and, and like I use a ZFS clone and all that kind of stuff. But I could actually get the I could actually get the patch applied inside Travis and, and app there. The reason for doing that would be one reason for doing that would be that like if the goal of this thing and this is just a proposal, right? If the goal of this thing is to hand it to PG Infra, 
then they probably don't want a FreeBSD box. I don't know. I mean, you, they're well, probably. We probably don't want to be running patch, um, which has obviously got the PE associated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So e even though the. Oh, you just that was, that, yeah, that, would be, that was actually the question I was going to ask earlier is why don't you use it? Have you tried to make yeah, it? Yeah. That would totally work. I'd be able to make that work very easily um, for Travis. Making the Windows thing do that, uh, you've got to be able to unzip tarballs and like, you know, all that kind of stuff. Can so you do that and just uh, commit the patches to the tree in some special file. Uh -huh. uh, do you trust? Uh, do you trust tar? <laughs> A lot more than patch. Okay. Like, yeah. yeah. So there could be yeah there could be a halfway option there where you do some of the work, but actually applying the patch happens inside the computer that we don't own. Right. Um, my main reason for that, yeah, is to make this thing more acceptable to PG Infra, because... Um, if we can get to a point where PG Infra doesn't have to run any, yeah. any Android that goes, then I would think we would definitely be, uh -huh. be open to running it. Uh -huh. So we'll that's... We'll probably find a way to actually run that on PG Infra as well, just not straight up. Yeah, yeah so possibly. the thing that I'm doing with... Um, Just for to make my testing pipeline for patches easier, because so I can just send everything to Travis and say, okay, here are all the patches, uh -huh. create patches for them, and test each. Oh yeah. Patch. Uh -huh. That way, I know no matter which patch people apply, in which order. Well, I mean, the order obviously has to be the same, uh -huh. but they're going to apply patch one, patch one two, patch one two, patch one two and three, and I know that they all work because I find that more and more I'm spending unusual amounts of time uh -huh. just generating and testing. Patches for things that I want to push up, even when I made a very modest number of changes, I then spent an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. Maybe goofing off and doing some other stuff, just waiting for yeah. test runs to finish, starting the next test run, doing whatever. And I've been starting to push that work up to Travis because. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. My use case is a little different, but I am able to apply patches uh, from from various branches. Uh -huh. uh, in Travis, you know, create the patch, okay. apply, uh, test it, Interesting. create the next, uh, uh, then apply the next patch, Interesting. build again, yeah. test, apply the next patch, build again, and test, and yeah. that does actually work. Oh, yeah, the, the, the issue isn't for Travis, it's that now. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, whatever <laughs> shell scripting wizardry is required in Linux is not going to be a problem, it's the, it's the Windows side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, Um, so, so, I mean, so, so another question which kind of, um, I guess, is going to come up is some people just want to propose code in a public Git repository. I mean, do we want to keep doing mailing list emails? I'm not here to propose we change anything. I was trying to build something that works with what we have, right? But um, I guess eventually people might want to do things differently. I don't know. But um, well, actually, I mean, if we tell people if you include some reference to your Git repo, mm -hmm. There's a yeah, thing for it. Yeah. Yeah. So one patch ever has filled that out. Literally <laughs> one. Okay, but if, if that starts happening, people can do that, and then that solves the app layer problem, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. And that, so, yeah. you we want your stuff tested on Windows, if you use yeah. this, yeah. I think that'd be fantastic. I don't mean that because Brand has never had a security issue. I don't care about security. We're not doing that. There, we're not doing that. It's not our problem. <laughs> well, you, yeah. it doesn't solve the problem entirely because somebody has to rebase that patch on. The branch on top of master yeah. things to yeah. this yeah. continuous testing thing. But yeah. And you can automate that if it doesn't yeah, but work. Yeah, we can automate that. We, our bolt doesn't necessarily have right permission. No, but can't you? You can do a three phase what? origin master. Yeah, yeah. What do you? <laughs> you do a three phase on Windows fairly trivial. I mean, that's not that happens. Yeah. It should be straightforward. Yeah. So, so th there's an error I didn't talk about um, earlier because. I guess it was too boring, but to have a slide about it. But um, but now that we're talking about this, it's sort of relevant. So one of the jobs that this thing has to do is deal with all the different ways that people post patches. And when I first started doing this, like I started out just like just looking for bit rot in my own patches. So I just like was looking for the way that I spelled them, like like just look for files called something dot patch and then apply them in alphabetical order, right, or sorted order. Um, but then when I started doing all the patches, you know, some people send patch dot gz, some people send you know. Uh, Tarballs, some people send like BZ2 and whatever. There's, there's 
there's like seven or eight or maybe more different ways that people do it. And somebody sends their patches in .txt files. Uh, I, don't, I don't try and apply those ones because like, <laughs> if I try to. <laughs> Yeah. So I actually originally thought that was going to be the hard bit, but that turned out to be trivial because, like, there's only so many ways people post patches. And, and I don't know whether it's because people are... Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's because people have started looking at my thing or, or if it's just because I've... Um, I mean, people, I've noticed that people started sending complete patch sets. In the past, people used to send patches, they would just send like one patch. Oh, by the way, you also need to apply that one over there and that one over there and point to other threads and so on. Yeah. And then this thing would just break because it, does, it, it doesn't speak English. So, um, <laughs> um, I've noticed no one does that anymore, so I think people must be looking at it, but I don't know, maybe. Well, I, I, you know, for people who are submitting patches that they're hoping that I will look at, I think they've learned that I prefer them in a series of smaller patches rather than one gigantic patch. Now, I think Tom's preference is the opposite, and there is a certain amount of adapting to the committer and things you're hoping whose attention yeah. you're hoping to get yeah, yeah. on there. So. I don't mind that. I just supply all the patches. You just supply them. But people, people who, who work a lot with me know that if they yeah. give me six things in a chain and I get up to number three before I see something that I'm unhappy with, then one and two will go in. And yeah. they're like, okay, I like that. Yeah. Um, so there's the SQL Smith thing. Um, Andreas Selton likes uh, really incredible. Why did you skip over the put stuff in the feed? Really, like, oh yeah. Sorry, I didn't do that on purpose. That. Yes, that is a thing which. Um, so if we had those files in the tree, then everybody's uh, public Git repos could just be turned on, and it would be really convenient. And like, you know, it, that that would be quite a cool idea. The only question is IRR control. For, well, first of all. Which external providers of stuff do we want to actually specifically have stuff on our tree for? Because yeah, those aren't the only games in town. If somebody submits it, why not? So yeah, I think we would have a, you'd probably have to. You don't really want 40 of those files in your tree, though. Right? Ah, they're called dot something. You won't see them. Just one. One file at the top level. They're all dot files. I think. For each provider, for uh, yeah, for each provider. Does anyone know, um, was Travis the first, or are they just the most famous? First. The first. No, like, will, you, will they need to be updated periodically? I, only if we change our recipe for what we want to do. But I mean, do they embed things like our choice of configure option? Like, yes. Yeah. That's kind of... Yeah, that's not really ideal. That's not really ideal, right? So, or maybe there's a way to... Can't people patch those into their Git repos? Well, yeah, that's what I'm doing. And yeah, so the, that's what I do, and and and, and it's called distributing the cost to everyone. Yeah, and that's what I do with, with my own work when I want to get my stuff tested on Windows. I just have this patch I apply and then I push it. Yeah, they have different ways of configuring and whatnot. You, you can, but then you have to make sure those things don't end up in the patch that you. Yeah. Well, that's what you get. Yeah. Yeah. on the committer sheds notice that they're adding a file. To or yeah. or it's just getting order, right? I mean, that's mm. just, yeah, it's just it's just a little annoying because when you're setting things up, that yes, getting order is more. <laughs> that's yeah. Yeah. It's really simple. It's just like it says. It's like a, you know, YML. It's like name colon value. It's one you've scripted, and then a can. Yeah. Oh, I did. I did. Didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. There. Like that's a minimum minimal file. You'd probably want to have um, a few extra things because you want to apt, apt get install some packages first. Yeah. You, you, you want to have like I don't know like lib readline dash dev and all that kind of stuff. So so that um, there's a few extra lines about that, but that's it. It's very little. Yeah, I mean I guess if we could get a configuration set up that would deal with all of the configure options anybody's likely mm -hmm. to care about. Well, that would be that it, 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 it seems yeah. like this is getting too specific to the particular test somebody wants. Yeah, it does, but it's like it's hard to know how else to do it. Like, I mean, like, how many people need to add new configure options in their new patches? I mean, like, eighty percent of the patches are actually some core code that like shared in all branches, and like you're never going to patch that. Right, but like, if your patches are being tested without LLVM, then we won't really know whether they work because your at least some of your patches will 
that get yeah. exercised and once the testing is done. Sure, but like how, well, how many times have we added stuff like that? And I know, would know that. No, no, what I'm trying to say is that if we're going to have it, it should probably be a, a reasonably comprehensive <laughs> configuration yeah, built definitely. with most of the options because okay. we don't, uh, otherwise we don't know whether we're really I mean, the the patch the 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 then, you then, then you don't know that it fails to build if you don't have uh, True. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so that's not like. You can make it random. The build form will tell you that. That's, you know, yeah, the whole point here is to try to. The, the, the real concern I have with these uh -huh. being in the central repo is that they're going to enforce a uniform testing uh -huh. configuration yeah. on them. So well, you can, you can still change exactly. them in your own development practice. That's not necessarily a bad thing, though. If we, if we come up with a set. Like I have the set here that I use for testing. C assert, tap test, coverage, open SSL, and depend. Those are the things right. I turn on when I'm doing well, you know, my patch testing. Well, let me give you an example. We routinely have complaints that some patch causes a problem in non assert builds. Right. Because it's it's nobody <laughs> ever tests it in that way. Right. Right. So, yeah. Um, hmm. But I, I mean, we've got the build plan. I don't think you expect every uh, contributor to like test with everything. Oh, okay. So, so yeah. here's a different. Here's a different Yeah, you can. You can go in there and configure it to go and find a file somewhere else. You, at least you can with that there. I'm not sure about Travis. Anyone know? Okay. Yeah. But it kind of removes the convenience of it, though. Like, what's cool about this is that if we had it in the tree, like a lot of software these days has these things in the tree. You'll see it everywhere. And um, it just means that like casual contributors can benefit from it without having to figure out how you set it up, because they won't figure out how to set it up, right? So. Um, and if you go into Travis, if you're logged into GitHub, somehow that single sign-on thing that they do, um, you just turn it on, and then that's it. And it says, do you mind if I do anything I want to your repository? Yeah. And you're like, sure, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty cool. No, when I, well. Yeah, we. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's an open question. I think we should keep considering that. Um, I don't know the answer. I'm not strong. I, I don't actually think that the files that I have right now are good enough, so I'm not proposing them right now. Certainly, the Windows one is not good enough. It's not even running all the tests, so yeah. Um, but eventually, when we have really good ones, um, we might want to consider that. Yeah. Um, code coverage reports, that's something I actually had earlier, but it was causing trouble, and I haven't got back to getting that working again. It was actually pretty cool. There's a, there's a website called codecov.io, and if you set your Travis um, build thing up so that it exports a file to those guys, then that website will then show you the code coverage um, for the lines that changed in your patch, which is really cool. Like, you can, like somebody posted us 100 lines of code, and the tests run them or don't, and you can see it very clearly. Um, unfortunately, actually doing the code coverage stuff was causing false failures on Travis, because um, that version of GCC, that has a, a bleeding edge version of GCC has fixed this problem. But the basic idea is that um, uh, what, is it, what are they, GDCA files that um, if you build with dash dash coverage, that they, they didn't think of a multi-process program hammering those files. So basically they, it corrupts itself, which doesn't cause a problem for actually running, but it causes it to print little warnings to, to standard error from time to time, and then that breaks our regression tests. So, yeah, yeah. I ran into that a while back. I got around it by dropping the dash J on the build. Kind of huh. <laughs> oh, no, this is actually at runtime. This is actually when it's running the code, when it's when it's when it's writing the files. Yeah. So it was happening maybe one in a hundred. Yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting. 
That's what we do too. In fact, that's just everything runs in Docker. So Interesting. we use Travis, but then we build Docker containers on top of Travis huh. to do all the testing for RHEL 6, RHEL 7, Ubuntu, huh. Debian, whatever. That's really interesting. Yeah. Huh. It gives you a lot of flexibility. Anything you can run in Docker, obviously Windows still is going to be this outlier. Mm. Um, but you can increase your test coverage enormously yeah. um, and have environments that are much more reproducible. You can also pre-build those containers, put them up on Docker, and actually pull them when the Travis test runs Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to spend all that time building, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier to build, build, you know, pull that pre-built container than to, um, mm -hmm. and that would also give the opportunity to run different settings in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, different GCCs, different settings, yeah. different uh, uh, yeah. um, kernels, yeah. uh, etc. Especially by the way, the question was nicely, uh, the nicely uh, snapshot to Docker would make a lot of the much much easier. Mm -hmm. Interesting idea. Thanks. Okay, so uh, the final thing I wanted to mention, it's probably not really part of this project, but it's just like a, an idea that kind of suggests itself once you start looking at the, the, this kind of thing, um, is automatic performance testing. Um, I, <laughs> I know uh, David's very interested in the subject. Um, it's, you know, can we come up with a set of tests that would actually be valuable? Um, personally, I've been using, in my, in my recent work on parallel hash joins, I was using TP, TPCH because that's what we selected to validate our stuff. Like we just, that's what we're going to use. Um, so I started building scripts that would, because, you know, when, you, when you're, um, when you've got a test where you've got to actually, like, do something for an hour to build the large data set, and people keep committing code, and then you have to keep rebuilding your database because you're doing this on master. So I, I got sick of doing that, so I sort of built some scripts to, do that when I was asleep, and then like I would have like TPCH fully loaded with 30 gigabytes of data or whatever it is um, that works with the latest master, and then I could test my stuff, which started me thinking, well, why don't I, why don't I, why don't I at least I, I, I be, at least test the master branch for every commit um, with like a suite of different performance tests? But could you come up with good enough performance tests to actually tell you something valuable? I don't know. I think that's the question, the difficult question. But. So there's a, I mean, there's a Google Summer of Good project. Essentially, a performance farm thing like the build farm mm -hmm. thing that's going to more consistently try to do performance tests. And one of the parts of that is going to be collecting tests to run, mm -hmm. right, over and over on you know, yep. on every commit, so yep. and then report the results back. So uh -huh. I would encourage you to chat with Mark about it. That sounds really interesting. Trying to yeah. move that along or at least give feedback yeah. on it. Yeah. Okay, that, sounds, that sounds good. I'd like to do something similar sure. to see if we yeah. provide resources. We got computers. Yeah. <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'd be really cool. We need a quiet environment. We have, uh, we have performance tests that we run in backrest, and we run them as part of CI just to make sure that they don't break. Uh -huh. um, but we set like all the limits down really low just so the performance tests will run. We know they run and mm -hmm. we haven't broken. But if we actually want to run them, we need a quiet system that we go to manually. Uh -huh. And then we bump up all the, all the limits so we're running like a real performance run, and mm. then we go do that performance run. But it's, I mean, at this point, it's still annual. Because the performance varies between the instances yeah. quite yeah. massively. Like, we, we tried running on Travis, but we had like, like, the numbers nice. all over the place. I mean, there's no consistency on Travis. No, yeah, there's no point you know, on that. Yeah, no. you, you probably need um, dedicated CPUs or whatever, I don't know. Um, yeah. right. like, we can it's actually handle you want to get about it, right? Yeah. How yeah. large for, if you're looking to spot, which is a very valid thing to do if you're looking to spot that 1% regression that, like, yeah. gee, I added a, a L2 miss into this hot code path. That's yeah. hard to do in a cloud environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. reproducibility of, of yeah. that to sort of but get it. You, you can still validate that, like, over time you're not, that you're staying within this, like, plus or minus 5% window kind of thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, it's way, tough. You need to make sure that you're not on the slow slope down. And yeah. All of a sudden, you're out of it, but it's not the last thing <laughs> yeah. that pushed you out. Like, yeah. I think that definitely this. happens. Yeah. So it well, seems to me there's, there's there's like two different kinds of things you could be doing. <coughs> One is looking out for unintentional regressions, what you're describing, and the other is validating some new piece of code that's supposed to make things faster. I think for that second thing, you kind of need to design special tests for the occasion, right? Because like, uh, I guess so anyway. Uh, um, but at least for watching out for regressions, that, that could be interesting. I don't know if it's worth doing something like that for every patch that's proposed or whether it's better to just do that on master. It's possible we can get some dedicated gear if we needed to. People are really needing that. 
Yeah. We have some people who work with the Android who can provide dedicated mm -hmm. so, I mean, just for example, we have PG Bench and SysBench and some other stuff that just runs 24 seven, like hour long runs at a time on nice. different instance sizes in all the regions. Yeah. And then we just report out the numbers and we alarm, you know, we, we're not going to alarm if it loses a little bit, but if it's outside of that band, mm. it yeah. runs. And yeah, each run gives a slightly different number, but they are tend to be within yeah. that within that range. Is that again? Well, I mean, are you doing this again, Ted, with different commits, or are you doing this just constantly your own? Commit? Constantly our own. Commit, yeah. Right. Right. So we do it both on software that we ship in production environments that customers would be able to create. We have those versions just get pounded, and then also off our own. So um, that's it. I, I also wanted to point out that several people have um, provided loads of really great input to make me to, to make this possible. Um, so thanks to those people. Yeah. Cool. Thank you.